que sí. Okay. Yep.
1, 2.
Good evening, everyone. It's as it's 6 p.m. already, so I invite everybody just just to grab a coffee, something to drink, something to eat, and uh, find a seat. There's plenty plenty left. Also, some VIP spots over here. Um, my name is Julius. I'm the head of Cloudwiser, and we're an uh, advanced AWS partner in the Baltic states. Uh, We'll be hosting you today, and it's uh, really a pleasure to welcome you at this event. Uh, we, ex I've seen that many people are still coming. Uh, it's uh, the end of the working day, so I expect all the all the, uh, all the chairs being taken already. And uh, it's uh, really a pleasure seeing a lot of people here. It means that serverless and then AWS are interesting topics, and I'm really very very happy about that because those topics are very interesting to us and to AWS as well. So, um, but you know, you're not here to listen to me talking. You're, you're here to, to to hear what the presenters and, and the highly skilled people have to say about serverless. And I'm I'm just here to say hello and uh, run through the agenda for us to 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 know what's happening next. So, uh, we'll have Paul from AWS uh, speaking about. Uh, overall uh, attitude and strategy on serverless from AWS side and, and going deeper into some services. Um, after that, we'll have a short break and then we'll have Tavi from Dashboard uh, talking about monitoring, uh, uh, monitoring serverless and then the challenges that come with that. And at the end, Dan uh, will be speaking and sharing his uh, Personal experience of developing a serverless app on on AWS, and then what what lessons were learned from 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 that experience. So, hopefully, it will be interesting. I invite you all to be to, you know active, ask questions, and so on. And uh, also have in mind that after uh, the presentations, we'll have some some snacks, some beers here, just to you know to to have a discussion. Uh, so don't don't hurry up home and. You know, use this chance to speak to the to the discuss with the speakers and uh, guys from from AWS from Cloudwiser. I'll, I'll just point you to the right people at, at the after the last presentation. And uh, to kick off the presentations, uh, I would like to invite uh, AWS uh, territory manager for Finland and the Baltics, Villa Tolnen, who's here to say hello to as well. All right, thanks, thanks, Julius. And uh, as he already mentioned, my name is Ville Tolonen, the territory manager or territory account manager covering Finland and Baltics. Not gonna keep Paul waiting for long, but uh, thanks for everybody joining here today, and, and thanks for also everybody for joining via the video. Um, yeah, with uh, further ado, I would like to give the floor to Paul, who will be diving deeper into the realm of serverless. Okay. Thank you. Nice to be here. Interesting stuff happening upstairs where they seem to tearing down the whole office. And uh, also it's interesting when I see it's the usual men and women in the room. And do you, I hope you know that programmer used to be a women's job in the 50s. By some reason we took it over and hopefully we will we'll be one more generation down the line we will be at least 50-50 again. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to talk, it's not going to be a deep talk, you're, not, you're going to see about five lines of code in total, sorry. There are some people that really want to see a lot of that. Uh, I'm not going to go in too much uh, on that. So, and the people that were at the serverless event that we had here a couple of weeks ago will see some things that are the same. Um, the presentation is also picked from different uh, presentations, so it will change style a little bit here and there. There, but um, I think it's what I'm saying that's the most interesting, rather than if it looks good. Well, anyway, I'm a uh, Senior Partner Solutions Architect at uh, AWS. Um, with that means that uh, I'm helping companies like Cloudvisor, that is an advanced partner here in, in the Baltics, uh, with technical enablement, see to that they get better to help their customers um, better. Otherwise, I have um, 
37 years in the industry as a developer, architect. Uh, I've been the chief solution architect on the fifth largest bank in Sweden and a few other things, uh, especially in the early internet days. I, I was uh, one of the guys putting up one of the first commercial websites in Sweden. I was one of the guys doing the first commercial uh, retailer, uh, a grocery store, the first grocery store that was ever built in the Nordics. Uh, anyway, that's not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about AWS, we're going to talk about serverless. So, let's see, we can get that one. You're crowding it, I think. Some technical problems for those listening in on the... The first time it worked. Beep, yep. Let's see if we can take that one as well. Yes, good. Um, so, AWS, what's AWS? Let's start back in 1994. There was this guy called Jeff Bezos that got this crazy idea, and if you're old enough to be in there, it was pretty crazy to try to sell books on the internet. Uh, because there were absolutely no payment systems around, uh, more or less. Uh, there were no logistics for shipping the books, etc. It was mail order firms that had the logistics. Uh, but, and, and the big retailers on books in the US, like Barnes & Noble, they said that you can never get economy uh, when you sell books. You don't make enough money. And Jeff said that Yes, economy at scale, if I sell millions of them, even though I only make a small fraction on each book, it will make money. And he started off, succeeded pretty well. Soon he sold a lot of more books, he sold uh, uh, a lot of other stuff. And in the process, we started to build an enormous um, an enormous infrastructure uh, of data centers. And after a couple of years, there uh, were people realizing that this kind of services that we were build they were building for Amazon internally could be used by others. And with that, the idea of the public cloud was born. And in 2006, AWS was created and in the beginning, there were three services. Storage, in the form of S3 that is still around. Uh, all these three are still active. Uh, it was EC2, the virtual machines, and it was SQS, which is a simple queuing service. Those are the three original AWS services. In the years that have gone by since then, we are now up, depending on how you count, I think the Unofficial count right now is 216 different services that we offer to customers. More if we should compare to our competitors that split the number of services that we keep together. They split as several services. Um, so uh, a lot of things has happened. And uh, today, that is, this is already old numbers. This is, these numbers are three, more, four months old. Uh, the thing is that in those 13 years, uh, AWS have grown and will end 2019 with a revenue of $35 billion. We grow, we grow $10 billion this year. We have the last three or four years grown a complete Asher every year. Uh, and we have about 52% of the total market today, about four times the size of the closest competitor. And um, we have millions of active users, and what we mean with active users are users or customers we built last month. I would guess that we're up to about four million of them right now. Did you want to s tell me something, or should I? No. <laughs> okay, so that's the commercial 
bit about AWS. Uh, anyway, uh, I can say that we, as of this year, we would have been the second largest company in the Nordics. We passed Mashk, which was the second largest the sh big shipping company. We passed them in revenue. So, um, and we are today about 12% of Amazon in total. So Amazon in total is somewhere between 300 and 350 billion dollars, which is the GMP of Estonia, I think. So, um, but the services we deliver, you're not supposed to be able to read this, okay? Um, we, we deliver these 200 plus services and we have grown to serve most everything you need to run uh, any, any kind of workload. We, we, our marketing don't like that we say it, but normally we talk about our services as Lego pieces. And some of these Lego pieces are the ones with just one dot. Things like DNS, uh, storage. Um, it's wrong to say simple services because the, the infrastructure behind it is quite complex, but it's simple services that provide small uh, things for the customers. And then we go all the way up to building things like the pirate ship. And the, pi the, the things that are the pirate ships right now that you have, you know, 8,000 pieces and you put it together, is a product, for instance, that called Amazon Connect, which is complete call center in the cloud, including telephony, services, everything you need, takes 10 minutes to start, costs about 30 cents on the euro uh, per user and day. Um, completely different style of working in that area than before. Or the latest uh, that we were actually a bit surprised ourselves when it came out because we on the sales side don't exactly know what they do on the engineering side, and it's something called Ground Station. Ground Station is complete, a complete infrastructure for taking down satellite data. Everything you need, including the satellite dishes. So if you have, for instance, is a researcher and need, have access to a satellite for two weeks, we have the infrastructure around the world. We're building stations around the world so that you, it doesn't have to be geostationary satellites. It can be any kind of satellite. And you can bring that data down straight into AWS and do analytics on it, principally in real time. So those are the kind of things we're building right now. Uh, and that is, all, that is available today. And we think that it's actually going to have more use than people think because the infrastructure in that case is pretty expensive, but if you're a researcher, you will be able to get to that satellite pretty easily. So we do everything that from all the basic stuff and all the way up to that, and we cover uh, everything from analytics to machine learning. That is the hottest area at the moment, even though we're going to leave that uh, aside today. Uh, but there is a lot of exciting things happening in all of these areas. Analytics is changing completely. Everything you know about data warehousing is going out the door. And it's much, much, uh, it's much, much uh, easier, faster, and cheaper to do things compared uh, the, when how it's been in the old days. For instance, if you need a Hadoop cluster, you bring one up, 20 nodes, takes five minutes, bring it up, Fill it with data, takes a couple of minutes, uh, do the analysis, do the reports, and throw everything away. You don't pay for, you only pay for the time it's been running. So it's a completely different world where you don't have to maintain your, your servers, you don't have to uh, do uh, investments in advance, uh, you just run what you need when you need it. Uh, and in the uh, analytics space, it's not uncommon that you can get, get uh, uh, a price reduction compared to on-premise with 80, 90 percent. It's a completely different world. Anyway, uh, but we're talking serverless today, and um, I have to be, do it the right way. Um, so what is serverless? There are a few things that we talk about. Uh, uh, first of all, it's a terrible word. 
uh, we don't really like it even though we invented it. Um, the thing is that uh, uh, serverless is anything but serverless. I mean, running lambdas, which is the, the function as a service, bad word as well, but the function as a service in a region, we're talking that we use tens of thousands of servers for you to be able to run that. And, and um, uh, so serverless isn't quite the word. You don't see them, but they are tens of thousands of servers. In a, in a regular region, we have something like, in a small region like Stockholm, we have something like 250 to 300,000 servers. In big regions, you can take 20 times that amount. So it's um, quite a lot of servers. Most, for most of the time, you don't see them at all. Uh, the thing is that you're not supposed to have any provisioning of infrastructure. That means that you don't have to start servers to run. Uh, the thing with lambdas, for instance, is that if you pay for every time you use it, every invocation costs you, even though we have a free tier, so you can run, I think it's a million calls a month without paying for it. Uh, and that is not as much as you think, because um, when we were running the bank, uh, we had, for the part that was to the users or the customers, we ran something between two and five million calls a day, and we were a small bank. We only had a few hundred thousand customers. Uh, so those a million uh, calls may sound a lot, but if you get any kind of scale in your application that will only help you a, a little a bit. The thing that is with serverless is that it should scale automatically without you setting it up. Because we have this concept of uh, uh, elasticity where you can, based on things that you get enough load or you get a number of uh, calls, you can scale your servers if you're still running them. Uh, so that you get more servers working. But that is not what this is. This is that you, you shouldn't have to care if you get one call a minute or a thousand calls a second. You shouldn't care. That we take care for you. That's serverless. Uh, the thing with, with it as well is that uh, it's built to be highly available and secure. Everything we do starts with security. Um, so uh, you cannot write a single line on code in a new service on AWS without knowing exactly how it's going to operate and interact with all other services and the world around it. When you know that and the principles on how you shall do that, then you're allowed to start to write the code. So we start always with security, and there's a lot of work done. It's not the normal way, where you have already written 10,000 lines of code when one says, someone says, OK, and how are people going to access this? And you have to plaster it on afterwards. That's not the way we operate. The thing is also with the serverless services. In AWS, we have the concept of, we don't talk about data centers. We call it, first, we call it a region. Stockholm or Sweden is a region. Redi a region is a cluster of cluster of data centers. The thing with the region is that it's always situated within a single country. So you know, for instance, what data laws that you operate under, because you will always operate under the laws of that country. Um, because we don't, with the exception for a few machine learning services that are mentioned for the geeky ones in 65.3 of our terms and conditions, we never ever move data from where it's placed. Uh, but the thing is, you have that region. The region has a cluster of clusters of data centers. They are called availability zones. Availability zones, the idea with having several of these is that they should be so far apart that if we lose a complete city and it will not come back, um, everything will still operate. But it cannot be further away 
from each other, then we have about one, one and a half milliseconds of latency between the data centers, which gives us a limit between 50 and 75 kilometers, something like that. Um, so in, in, in Sweden, for instance, um, we have three availability zones, one placed in Katrineholm, one in Eskilstuna, and one in Westerås on the west side of Lake Mälaren, which ends out in Stockholm. Um, and, and if you look at the map, you will understand the concepts I just told you. But the thing with all this is that if you run something serverless, it will not run in one of these areas and in one of the data centers in one of those areas. It will be in every single data center in every area, at least once. So if we lose half a data center, you won't see it. If we lose two cities, you still won't see it. Because everything runs everywhere in the region. And that makes your applications built with this technology extremely resilient to failure. And you get that without doing anything. You build your application. You don't have to think about failover. You don't have to think about things like uh, what happens. Because everything is built into the system. So you can concentrate on building your application, building your business value. That is serverless. And that goes for the high availability stuff. And as always in the cloud, you only pay for what you use. So if you run have a service that is only used three times a day, you will never pay for it. It will operate and it will work, but it will never reach the limit where you have to pay for it. Uh, and if you don't use it, uh, you won't pay, which makes these applications where you have very spiky workloads, you get a, an economy in moving to this area. It's not un uncommon when people migrate from the old uh, with servers and they migrate uh, to these kind of um, architectures that we're talking about today that we lose about 90% of the revenue. It's so much cheaper. And um, uh, so you would think that we wouldn't promote this, but this is the way of the future. This is how applications are built in the future, which is here now. It's just a question of the getting more applications there. You won't have, you will not bother about servers. Even containers are old school, really. Uh, the thing is that in, in the modern way of building applications, you, if you're a developer, care about that you get a service that do something and gets the data from point A to point B or whatever it does. And you don't really have to care about anything else. And the, that makes it much more fun. Unfortunately for me, I made all of my career building all that stuff behind the scenes that a good application needs. Uh, so most of what I've really uh, done through my career, you don't do anymore. <laughs> so um, I have to find new things to do. So I talk to you instead. But anyway, this is what we, how we define the concept of serverless. And a lot of people talk uh, about microservices today, which is a concept that has been around for a pretty long time. And it's important to know that microservices by itself uh, is not serverless, but they operate very well in a serverless environment. Because you can build a microservice architecture in a traditional environment, that's no problem at all. It's just that you have a number of servers that you have to take care of. Uh, the, the difference from the really old world, because we always talk about the monolith, and, and most applications that are considered fairly modern today, they are a tiered application where, or uh, island application where you have big islands of different things that you, you do. So you don't have one big application that does everything. Some of you do. I know that, but, um, but the thing is, the important thing when it comes to microservices is 
to really grasp the thing that a mi uh, microservice does one thing and one thing alone. So you, you don't, because normally you put services together to get something that is convenient. The thing is that the microservices itself shall only do one thing. The convenience you create, for instance, by putting an API gateway in front of it so that the consumer of the service feel that they talk to one API, but behind the API it can be 200 services that runs uh, autonomously and can scale autonomously. That's the thing with the microservices, is that, for instance, um, if you make a, a traditional API with, say, 30 API, different methods, the thing is that out of those, maybe two are really hot that you use. But to scale those two, you have to scale the whole thing. Um, with these kind of services, it will only be those two that will scale up. The others can run uh, in their own uh, number of times and you only pay for that. So that's, that's also one of the things with microservices. So microservices in, in itself doesn't give you serverless, but it's an important part of building serverless. Because if you don't use that kind of technology, your applications will not be able to scale properly. So, um, So to so say so, so is that the cloud native architecture, it should be a lot of small things working together, very loosely joined. Um, big applications today, and now we t when we're talking big, we're talking more than 10 million users. They don't have one database behind, they may have six or seven databases, which are totally separate. One for customers, one for orders, one for uh, products, etc., and everything will be eventually consistent. In the old world, and I've been working with databases for th over 35 years, I started very early, before even SQL was a standard. I started uh, working with databases, and everything in the old world with databases is that it's always consistent. Either you have it or you don't. But that, if you're going to build this, uh, an application that will scale for the internet age, you can't build it that way. Because your database, a, re a relationship database won't take it. And they are not built for those kind of loads, not even the big ones like Oracle. They can't really handle that kind of load. So for instance, now finally, it took a couple of years, but Amazon has now moved completely off Oracle, for instance for everything, because it doesn't scale the way it's needed in the modern age. But everything is loosely joined, so, uh, and, and then you get this question, of course. Hey, I used to have a front application, a server application, and two databases. That's pretty easy from a deployment point of view. And now you tell me you're going to have 300 deployment items. And yes, uh, that is more complex. And there we come into one of the most important things in the cloud. And that is, if you go cloud, if you have a human involved in the deployment process, or any process, you failed. You can't scale. You won't be able to do it. So one, if you haven't moved into the cloud era, and are, thing, and are moving into the cloud era, you have to bring DevOps with you. It's not something you do on the side or afterwards. It's an integral part of being successful in the cloud, and it has to be there from the beginning. Or it doesn't has to because, uh, have to because you may have already been there, but it will the pain if you don't take it in from the beginning when you build applications. Uh, when, when it comes to the cloud, there are two things that has to be there from the beginning if it's going to be really good. And DevOps is one of them, and security is the other one. Security is not something you put on afterwards. That should be designed into your applications from the beginning. Otherwise, uh, you will get problems of, of controlling them. So the idea is anyway that, yes, you will have 
easily maybe two or three hundred different services running. Um, but the thing is that what do you gain from this? Well, the thing is that instead of having these big groups that has a large responsibility to get everything to work together, maybe your team only have 10 of those services. And you can release, you can do two changes in one of those, as long as you don't change the contract of the service, you can release it whenever you need. You don't have to wait for the guys, if we talk a bank, I can tell you, I worked on a bank, and I was, I'm a securities guy. Stocks, funds, everything happens more or less in real time, not with funds, but with, with, with stocks. So everything has to happen now. And that affects everyone that works with those kind of things as well, because that, we had this, we wanted to release every day. That's not as easy as you think in a bank. If you're uh, in born in the cloud, you say, hey, we release every day. Yes, but in a bank, you have rules and regulations and documentation and stuff. You have. We wanted to release every day. The guys back on loans that had house loans, they wanted to release once every second month, because they thought that, oh, Things doesn't change that much. A loan is a loan. We do some small stuff. and So we had this span. And by splitting Scandia Bank and where I worked, we started to do, we were not finished when I left and, and joined AWS, but we started to do this journey and split everything. And we came to the point that, for instance, security could release every day, while the loan guys that didn't like that, they could release every second month. You also get that kind of freedom in a big system like this, that changes are small, but they occur very often. So, serverless again. Um, so we offer a number of different things when it comes to serverless or traditional. The most traditional is, of course, that you, you use regular virtual machines and uh, you have databases of different types, uh, or, or you can run Docker, your own Docker or Kubernetes clusters. Uh, so you have that freedom altogether. Then we have something we call managed services. And what is a managed services? A uh, service. Well, mostly it's that we actually take an already existing product, and then we remove all of the maintenance around it, so that you don't. The only thing you have to care about is the size of the machine. You don't have to security patch it, you don't have to upgrade it, you don't have to upgrade uh, the, the software. Um, so for instance, we have Amazon RDS, which is the regular relationship databases. Uh, and there we have a number of options, like you can run a SQL server, you can run Oracle, MariaDB, MySQL, Postgres SQL. Uh, and you can run our take on MySQL and PostgreSQL, which is Aurora. Uh, but the thing is, you don't have to maintain the servers and the system. So you can start moving your resources from infrastructure and maintaining, this, maintaining the environment to getting the pro more programmers in to do more business value. So we call those services managed services. Some we have created ourselves. And some come, uh, most of them come from others. And then we have more or less good names. I still can't figure out the brilliant mind that came up that we should call it Elastic Map Reduce. That's our Hadoop cluster. Uh, and I can't really figure it's, it's an algorithm that was used in that world many years ago. But I still would have called it something with Hadoop or whatever. Um, anyway. And then we have what we call the serverless services. So on these managed services, you still see the servers because they will show up in your list of EC2s in, in many of the services. But you don't have to do anything with them. Uh, but they are there, and, and you decide the size. But when you get out to this side, everything is gone. You have no clue if you're running on one or a hundred servers. That's gone. Lambda is the, 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 thing that the, the thing that is fun with Lambda is that it's one of the few things that we have created that customers have come to us and told us. The thing is that 95% of the 
backlog we have on AWS comes from our customers. And it's customers that come, we have a business problem in this area, we need a technical solution for it, can you fix it? Like the ground station with the, the infrastructure. And we do that. But the thing with, with Lambda was that that is one of the few things that is an original invention from AWS. We had people that heard things from many different customers. They couldn't really put words on what they needed. But some bright guys got together and Lambda was born. And Lambda is functions where that scale autonomously, every single function that you use. Uh, so that's the centerpiece of, of the serverless offerings. And then we have a lot of other things. Uh, important if you're building applications is step functions. Uh, normally in the old days, or older days, you built what's called orchestration services. You have a number of services and then you build a service that consumes those services, put something together or make a flow and then finally you get the result back to the persons working with it. Step functions replaces the orchestration services so you don't have to code them. So you, with JSON, you define how they will talk with each other and, and uh, what will come out of it, and you can remove those uh, orchestration services so you don't have to maintain that code. And they are more resilient when it comes to changes than, than what uh, regular code is, especially if you're in the SOAP world. Uh, but th these are a few of the things that we have. And, and the thing with, the, with all these, and, and you even see that the first serverless service we did was the f first one, or rather the second one, because SQS is the first of the first. But S3 is a serverless service. You have no clue if your files are where they are, how many copies we have, um, and what we do with them. The thing is that if you want some details on S3, if you give a file that is bigger than 64 kilobytes, kilobytes, we split that in chunks of 64 kilobytes, kilobytes. And then you have at least one copy in every section in every data center that we have in the region. So if you place a file in S3, you probably have a file maybe have 10, 20 fragments, and every fragment is stored at least maybe 10 times, 10, 15 times. That is why we can promise this enormous 99.999999999999% uh, of uh, availability for, for those files, which boils down to that you may lose one file every 10,000 years. Uh, but this is basically what you have on the left side, that's what we call basic services. In the middle is the manage and you have the serverless to the right. Um, and serverless application, one of the most important things to learn, the thing is that when I started programming, I'm old, I'm really old, when I started to program, the thing was that the response re the request response thing that has been completely dominant for the last 20, 25 years, weren't really there. You sent files. Uh, if you were lucky, you could use middleware, uh, message queuing, which is, is maybe the oldest one, has been around for soon 50 years. Uh, and you used that to send messages, and that was event-based. But then came along, uh, when the internet came along, First you started with socket services. You connected to a socket and you could do request response there. And then came the web services with everything. First SOAP and then the rest stuff. And for most of you that are not old enough, that has been the completely dominant model for programming. And now that is going away again. And now the next step is to go actually go back to where we started, to have what's called an event source. The event source is that something happens in your environment. It could be an alarm in CloudWatch, something has happened, an intrusion or whatever it may be. It may be a file that is dropped into S3. 
um, and a lot of other things. And that event triggers a lambda, which you can program in, in a number of languages. And today we actually have bring your own language. So if you would like to do a COBOL lambda, you can actually do it. You have to do some work to get the language interpreter in, but we have all the APIs you need to do it yourself. So you can actually use any language you like today in lambdas. Uh, and the lambda, that should do one thing, do something, and then change something in the other end, which may trigger a new lambda, that can trigger a new lambda, etc., etc. Et so there ca can be change of things happening uh, with this. But the important thing is, because if you come from the request response world and you create your first lambda, and you set it up, and you access it through an HTTP, hey, this is a request response. And yes, it is, but no. Lambda is not request response. What we do is that in front of the lambda, we set an API gateway. And with the API gateway, suddenly you have the re response re request response model. And that confuses people sometimes, because if you want to see lambda as a request response, yes, you can do that. But lambda does so much more. And what happens, why do we do it with the events? Well, the thing by doing it with events is that you can remove much of the infrastructure in most applications. So that you, you have little islands of logic. And in the old days, and this was what I was a master on, you built infrastructure in your application to have it, hold it together, to see that these pieces of logic work together. The thing is, if you do this, we take care of the infrastructure between. So you don't have to do that. I think life has become a little bit more boring, but uh, I think that we will get a little bit more productive. <laughs> it's just that I like doing that. Uh, but this is one of the most important things to understand, the difference between the request response and the event and why Lambda may look like a request response, but it's not. Um, and then we have this which says, okay, what can you use Lambda for? And it's principally everything that we have put up here. Um, a lot of the in interesting stuff what we use Lambdas for in the AWS or other customers do, is that, for instance, on the security side, you can very easily do things like make it impossible to log into a server if you still use the servers without that there is a ticket in your ticketing system. It's not a hard thing to do. You need about 50 lines of code to do that. As long as you can talk to your ticket system, you can make that the master of that Nothing will open up to access the server unless there is a ticket in the ticketing system, and when the ticket is closed, the access will be revoked. And this is done with lambdas and something called uh, config and with CloudWatch. So, number of names. The thing with this is that now we get back to the Lego pieces. If you look at every single Lego piece that we have, it's not that powerful. Most of them, well, some are. Some are really good and really helps you. But most of them single-handedly doesn't do that much. And some are, are actually an island of its own, like RDS. It does databases. That's what it do. But when you get into these things like the simple queuing service, the simple notification service, uh, config that checks config changes in the environment, CloudWatch, that where all your metrics goes in, and when you start to react on those events, suddenly you have an environment that lives by itself. It doesn't really need humans to guard it all the time. It will self-heal, it will self-control, and then things are getting really exciting. But, and the lambdas are the action key in that, because the lambdas are, are the thing that actually do things. But it reacts on the events, and the events come from all around in, in, in the AWS world. And that's really cool stuff. Uh, it's good to have some lambdas behind uh, Alexa. Uh, if you 
would like to build something that, because you maybe you need some data before you can answer the skill. And it's also good doing chatbots and a few other things. But anyway, uh, normally it looks like it's everything, but there are differences when you shall use um, serverless or maybe go container or maybe go traditional. Uh, we're not saying that you can replace everything with serverless, not yet. Uh, but one thing that serverless is really good at, it's when you have spiky loads. Loads that, for some, you may have a low and a high diff of maybe 10, 20% on the number of messaging or things, actions you do in the system. Uh, you may have more of a peak, but little. But if you have systems that may go a couple of thousand percent from the low to the high, then, uh, then these kind of solutions can become interesting. To give you an easy example is that take a horse racetrack. 95% of the time, even during race day, nothing happens in, in uh, the gambling systems or the systems that take all the bets. It only happens, you know, a few guys that goes 20 minutes before the race, they go and because they already know they have signed up everything in advance and they know. But most people, they go in the last five minutes. Then a, a system built on lambdas, for instance, is the excellent because if it can scale very quickly up to race to take these kind of loads, even though that in some cases to be sure you actually have to go the other way and be pretty traditional and then run up during race day, they run up 2,000 servers and then the server sits there and then they kill, they take that cost and then they kill the whole thing the next day. So it may be different, but that is the kind of workload where serverless uh, shines. Let's see, oh, yeah. And just to take uh, a small example on how it looks is that when you see architecture diagrams with, with AWS, it, it looks a little bit different because it normally just gives you what services you're using and not so much, uh, you know, that in, in, the, in the tradition you have a database layer and you have an application layer and you have a front end layer and so on. It looks a little bit different. But to be serverless, one of the most important things is that it should be stateless, which means that it responds to something when it's done, it has no clue that something has happened, no state. Um, we did that for the bank, for instance. We took away uh, the state as much as we could, so we could, we killed the state in all the web servers and the little data we really needed for user friendliness, your accounts and latest payments, we actually put in a cache. So it was readily available if the customer needed it and we cleaned the cache if nobody accessed within a certain period, but the service itself had no clue that for whom it was operating. Every, every uh, call should be completely stateless. And I can say that I have never ever built a stateful service, so this is not a new concept. I started building services in the early 90s or even the late 80s. And, and already then we tried to avoid having state. Uh, I've already been talking that it's self-healing and highly scalable. That is what we give you. Uh, the stateless you have to provide. Um, small microservices can be containerized or, or they can run as lambdas or, or there, there are a number of things where containers are, work better than, than um, lambdas and I will come to that soon. Um, we think you should use our serverless platform, duh. Um, and, um, uh, and a few other things. The other things is, is uh, well, the, the, the thing is that the allocation of resources, which means is scaling, uh, should be dynamic and completely managed when it's managed by us. Uh, I don't know why Route 53 is there, but, but um, anyway, so these are some of the basic treats if you want to go serverless 
on, on our platform. I'm sorry that some of these uh, doesn't look good, not my computer. Um, but they are, as I said, places where Lambda is well, serverless, event-driven code execution. And now you know what the event-driven is. And there are places where containers will do the job better. The thing with lambdas is that they are good for traditional request response services. Normally you would say if you go over 500 milliseconds, your services is way slow. Um, but we're talking about 15 minutes. If you have things like, like kind of batch jobs, uh, lambdas can't handle it. They're not built to, to run for so long with one query. So then you have to look at other things. Um, and if you already have existing code, it may not be able to, to translate that into lambdas. So, and then containers make a good use case on this one. And how do you decide this then? Well, here's a little decision tree. Um, can you run in lambdas? Oh, that's nice. Uh, yes. Uh, is it small? Is the deployment package less than 50 megabytes, including... Now it's a little bit better because we introduced something called lambda layers, which means that you can put common, uh, de common code uh, in one place and deploy it once. Uh, but up until a little just six months ago you had to have everything like its own little universe with all the DA, with all the libraries and everything so in total you couldn't exceed 50 megabytes um, the desired runtime for the service is it longer than 15 minutes then it shouldn't be running in a lambda environment then you should be using something else um, if you have uh, as I said, spiky workloads. Um, does it uh, have inter-container communication, as they call it, or is it storage intensive? No, then you should use the Lambda. If we answer no on other, all the others, except the one where we answer yes, which is the one to the right there, uh, then you should look on... Um, Okay, then you have two options. You can go uh, Docker or you can go Kubernetes. And if you like uh, open source and Google and all this, then you can use AKS, which is managed uh, our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, not 100% yet. Uh, getting there, but it's taken much longer than we thought, I think. Uh, we still run more than 51% of the world's uh, Kubernetes clusters today, all together, on-premise or in the cloud. So it, it has definitely succeeded, but I've heard with the people that work, it, that, that work with it that there are some serious pain points in it. Um, that was interesting. And that is another presentation. Uh, what happened there? Let's go back here. Oh, and if you don't want to run Kubernetes, then you have to ask yourself, do you want to manage your own infrastructure or do you not want to do that? And what we mean with that is that if you want to have control over your cluster, you should use the Docker variant of this one, the Elastic Container Service, which runs Docker services. But and this is where I mean that where we're going serverless for more and more. Fargate is a good example of this. You don't have to manage the cluster anymore. You can have your, your containers, you f configure it, and you drop it in there, and we take care of the infrastructure, which could be nice. Uh, but it's always a question on how much control do I want? I mean, whatever you do, you have these guys that just want to get going and doing things, they're the perfect AWS customers. And then you have the guys that have, want to have full control of what's happening. We can handle them as well. But that is why some go Lambda and some stay on EC2s. 
But anyway, uh, so this is a little decision tree, and I presume that the people that want it will get a copy of these presentations afterwards. So, so if you want the pictures, you will get it from Julius and the guys. Yeah. Sorry? I'm going to send it back to you. What technical decision have you ever taken that is not a lock-in? The language you uh, choose is a lock-in. The database technology you choose is a lock-in. Yeah, but I mean, um, the thing is that you choose which of, and you can take this and move to GCP, or you can run your own cluster. I mean, you, your containers are movable. So uh, we don't lock people in, put in that way in those. It's when you go lambdas, then the thing is, one of the things you should do when you write lambdas, one of the good things is, uh, is idea is to keep logic and the actual lambda code separate. So because if you can do that, then you can actually uh, for instance, if you're in the Windows world, then you can run it both as a regular service or as a Lambda service with the same logic in them. So um, it's, it's a question on what you do. But if you have a container, it's movable to anywhere. You can have, run it on, on Red Hat or you can run it uh, with GCP or you can run it with Azure or whatever. So the container itself is completely movable. It's, the, pr the thing where it's not movable, movable is when you start to use the services that is not common. Uh, but then you have to ask yourself, is, how important is this movability? When I was younger, um, there was all this talk in the Unix world that you had to write portable code. And then I asked people, okay, so how many guys, times have you ported the code between different platforms? Zero was the answer in 99 cases out of 100. So it may be important. Then you should look into things. Then container technology is good because it's portable. Uh, but as soon as you start to use independently of something that Azure or we or Google provides that does not exist in its same form in other platforms, then you have a lock-in. Uh, the problem is that the lock-in debate will lock you into old technology that is going away, that will not be developed anymore. So uh, the thing is, you have to answer for yourself is, is okay, but what is the kind, type of lock-in uh, effect that really affects my customer or myself? Another thing that comes with this world is that if you build it, you run it. I don't think that we in 10 years have the big central IT departments that we have today. They will to 90% be gone. These people will run your mail server and they will run your, your collaboration platforms, but you will not have an ops department because the code will move out to the business. The developers will move much closer to the business and you will have hundred in a big, big organization, like the biggest Swedish ones, you will may have a hundred IT departments running their code for the business. And this is happening already, it's starting to show, and it will accelerate over time. And, and the rule is, if you build it, you will run it. And that means that you will have not one IT department running your environment, you will have plenty. Gives you speed for business, it gives you less control. But to be successful, you have to understand the serverless concept. If you want to release the power, fortunately, you will have to go on things that are uh, native to the platform you work on. The good thing is that if you use this, you will minimize the boring stuff, or the fun stuff, if you ask me, but the boring stuff of getting the applications to become steady. Uh, I was talking about this, Embra embrace DevOps, it's an absolute necessity. You cannot sit and do manual uh, uh, deployments. You should look into things like, like cloud formation or, or 
Uh, if you're using our platform, uh, there are others that are good. Terraform, for instance, if you want to be able to deploy to different clouds. But any human intervention in this process is a failure. Remember that. And you should not only do DevOps, you should do what's called DevSecOps uh, for your own sake. And, and the general cloud rule is what I, what I said before, and I say it again, it's not something you put on afterwards. It has to be there from the beginning. Learn to work. Learn to like your security guys. They can be nice when you do good stuff for them. They, they are only cranky when you come afterwards and feel that they are a pain because they want you to secure your application. If you work with them from the beginning, they will like you very much. Um, and I will end with some tools. Uh, we have to, to... The problem is that sometimes when you go from the modern... Uh, if you, for instance, are working in the, in, in the Microsoft world, uh, you used to that you can debug principally anything anywhere. Uh, and when you go to the cloud, you will suddenly feel that you're back in the 90s again. Um, we have something called SAM. Uh, which is a tool set to help uh, you be able to do debugging and other things locally where you have full view of what's happening and where you can see what processes are running and so on. Uh, so if you're anywhere than the Windows world, this is really good. In the Windows world, you can actually choose to uh, use uh, web services and, and MVC the way so that you can either run it locally or you can run it in the cloud as a Lambda. It works both ways. Uh, so you can actually, it's easier, uh, you have a little bit on, on what uh, you have in the Windows world when, when you do development with those things. Uh, but SAM is something you should look for when you start to develop. Uh, it will help you to debug your applications. And then we have something that I, I was talking about something called cloud formation, and that is infrastructure as code. The thing in the cloud is that it's not just the software you deploy. You deploy your security rules, you deploy your networking rules, you deploy um, everything that sits around the application, the security, everything security, everything infrastructure and everything. And this is done by cloud formation. Cloud formation talks to languages. Uh, it talks either JSON, which is a file format, that's why I do languages with a thing around it, or YAML, which is yet another market language. Uh, the thing is that it's another syntax to learn, it's another model to learn on how to do things. So a number of people, both inside and outside AWS, decided to create something that is called the Cloud Development Kit, or the CDK. And the CDK helps you to write the actual deployment code in code, regular code. So if you want to do it in Java or JavaScript or C Sharp or, you can, or Python, you can um, do that, which makes it much, much simpler than having to have that syntax that is completely different from what you used to. So um, have you traversed into this world and done some cloud formation, I do recommend definitely to do the CDK, have a look at it because it becomes real code, much simpler, at least in my mind. So that is some tools to look into if you work with our products. And this is a small introduction to what we have to offer on, on the AWS platform. Uh. We still have time for a few questions. Uh, so, are there any uh, from the audience? Uh, other question is uh, controlling the bill. At least some some services on, on Estonian company is quite big and worldwide. Who is running uh, on real time advertisements worldwide, and they started to get uh, from the cloud, uh, you know, five pages bills. Yeah. of code, and they didn't understand why this service was so high scaled up, and they moved to the back to the, you know, the one step lower infrastructure to control this load. Uh, so, the billing question, yes? 
Well, the billing question is that, that it has to be that detailed so that you understand what it is that has stuck up your cost. But what most people do is that they, instead of owning the accounts themselves, they, they go through a reseller. And the reseller will probably give you a bill with two lines. And you will be happy to that until that bill suddenly is wrong or suddenly cost a lot more because, I mean, it is consume-based, which suddenly if you do something, it can even be very common, suddenly you do a for loop that stacks up things that happening in the system. So instead of, the classic example is a for loop within a for loop, and uh, that is extremely dangerous because if someone puts in a for loop, suddenly you do something a hundred times within a hundred times and then things will start to cost. And then you will have to have that kind of detail to debug what is it that has driven my cost. So it's a, it's a balance between those two. But most companies, uh, they run and let a reseller take care of all that, and then they get one bill. And most resellers can also make one bill from different providers. So if they're running some stuff at uh, Azure and some with us, some with VMware and so on, they can get one bill. So it's, uh, it's, it's a little But We need to be that technical to be so that people are able to find out why has sud I have paid between 100 and 150 dollars for the last six months and this month it was 750. What happened? And that's why it's so detailed. Yeah, uh, I would like add to uh, at, at Paul's uh, saying that you know that's why partners as uh, Cloudwiser exist for us to yeah, to help you with the billing, help you with the cost optimization, and uh, put everything in line. So we have tools for that, and if that's that's a problem. We can definitely sort that out. But uh, as we are already running uh, behind the schedule. Let's have 10 minutes break now, and then we'll come back with uh, Tavi talking about the monitoring, which is very yeah. relevant. In this and I, I, I will be here all night, yeah, and I and will uh, be ha here for the little social thing afterwards. So if any m questions you come up with, we can talk on the side later on. Yeah, so. we, we have uh, time now, and after, uh, after all the presentations, plenty of time to talk and discuss.
Hello. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so everybody, uh, uh, please get back to the places because uh, we're about to meet our second speaker today, and, and I'm pretty excited to welcome Tavi from Dashboard, and he will be covering the topic of monitoring serverless, which is a uh, thing, uh, thing very connected to the last question we got uh, during the last presentation. So, Tavi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we start, can I get a show of hands of how many have built something on serverless already? Just to get an idea, like some hands. 20%? That's really good. Uh, so first off, why am I qualified to talk about this? Um, a couple of years ago, we started with this company called Tashbird which is a monitoring platform for serverless, so it's pretty close to the subject today. We have over, a paying, uh, over 100 paying companies around the world, mostly in the US. Uh, they are corporations that have built substantial workloads on serverless uh, at scale, and we have over 4,000 AWS developers on our platform. And yeah, we've been in the, in the wild for uh, two plus years. Um, so yeah, this is the learnings that we have learned over the course of uh, the existence. Um, I think the first thing that I want to address uh, always when I talk about serverless is what it actually is, uh, my version of it. Um, so it's not function as a service, which is really often what people think about. Uh, I think what the industry is shifting towards and what is this kind of a bigger underlying shift is that developers get to focus more on creating new business value that is uh, differentiating them from the competitors rather than uh, wasting their time on undi undifferentiated heavy lifting that is managing and scaling servers. Uh, and that means that the uh, go-to-market speed goes up, the uh, cost and the service quality, uh, or like the cost goes down and the service quality goes up as well. Uh, so think of it as an operational construct of uh, basically the cloud provider doing the heavy lifting uh, and you get to focus on what really matters. Uh, so a couple of differences or kind of ana anatomical differences of serverless applications. Uh, they consist of managed single purpose services such as AWS Lambda, DynamoDB, SQS, but also from the outside you can find Out0 for uh, user management and um, Twilio, MongoDB Atlas, such services that uh, are also kind of serverless. Uh, the complexity is moving away from runtime into higher level, so you orchestrate small pieces of logic together, and uh, usually the one Lambda function is a really simple piece of code, while the architecture itself if you have like hundreds of functions, is complex. And developers usually have a lot less control over the resources. Um, so for example, you cannot uh, access the runtime uh, or like the code level access of your DynamoDB database or something like that. Um, so this is kind of how you get started with serverless. You kind of do one case study or something, you build something and it's really easy. Um, then you build maybe a microservice on top of it and it's still kind of manageable but as it transforms into a scalable uh, or at scale production application, uh, this, is, this can be a picture of your architecture, which is quite complex. And there are some caveats of kind of uh, being efficient in operating it in production. So this is the kind of uh, main subject of my talk today, how to run this effectively in production. Um, so, kind of setting the goals for monitoring, uh, I think the basics, uh, there are two things that are your main concerns or what are the most important things. The first thing is uh, reducing the time to discovery. Uh, so, how much uh, time from the problem happening to you discovering it is like 80% of the work you need to do in your monitoring application. Uh, so, the faster you learn about it, um, the the better it is. Uh, the other part is uh, time to resolution. So if you know about the problem, how fast can you fix it? And the 80 and 20 uh, apply pretty well here. 
So let's talk about the first, uh, reducing the time to discovery. Uh, so a couple of things that you can kind of, or have a setting, is that uh, the cloud services actually report all the data already. So they report logs, metrics, and traces uh, to their own uh, kind of buckets, that, um, and they do that by default. And your job is to monitor the outputs, uh, to learn of failures and uh, decreased performance issues. Um, so kind of on a l really simple way, you can set metric alarms and listen for uh, the metric going over a threshold. I think we still don't have all the slides. <laughs> we actually have a couple of slides, slides mi missing. Um, the other thing that you should be uh, looking for are events in the logs. So if your application is producing logs, which all the managed, or a lot of the managed services do, you need to look for issues there so that the faster you learn about them, then you can all also discover the incident. Uh, but yeah, if a user reports a problem, means it's already over, you have already lost. <laughs> and uh, this is extremely hard to actually um, know of all the problems before your users do, but you can try to do your best and kind of, um, this is a, a, an infinite struggle. So uh, it's next to impossible to kind of account for all the failures that will happen, but you kind of continually need to get bit better at this. And this, we're a monitoring company that have done this for two years, and this is yesterday. So this still happens all the time with us as well. Um, so the second part, or the next 20% of your monitoring problem is actually how fast are you able to find the resolution why, once you already have an issue uh, that you know about. Um, so there are kind of two scenarios that I would like to cover here. The one is when you get the, an alert of any kind, either from a user or from your notification service, um, then you, um, you already get the context that is available so you can immediately tell what's wrong and fix it. So it's, if it's like a really simple stack trace, you can immediately see what's wrong and just fix it. Uh, this is often not the case for distributed serverless applications. Um, and what is kind of the biggest challenge what that we see uh, in our customer is basically uh, achieving observability for at scale applications. And observability means the ability to interrogate uh, your system for any point of time. When you go back, you can see all the logs and metrics. You can easily navigate them and visualize the entire kind of act, um, mesh of activities that have taken on. Uh, and uh, while monitoring is something that we do, we monitor the system. Observability is basically the property of the system. So does the system uh, output all the data points that make it observable from the outside? I think we have all the wrong slides, actually. <laughs> Can you do something? <laughs> Yeah, um, so basically what, uh, what you need to achieve is uh, the cloud provider usually uh, provides the logs and metrics and traces, the kind of base level of data. And your job as a monitoring or observability person is to uh, make that data easily navigatable and being able to visualize that so that in any point of time, you are able to bubble up the meaningful information and basically understand if your system is working well, and if it is, and if it is not, then the ability to navigate to the data point that lets you know what is the failure about. Um, so a lot of observability is um, kind of wrong, wrongly understood, and we see a lot of um, like the approach still being uh, pure log analytics, which is um, good for like, uh, classical container applications where the uh, problems I is in one place. Uh, but if you are dealing with a distributed ap application, then you need to be able to correlate logs and metrics and traces on time and actually on the ingestion time 
uh, map them so that you get uh, the ability to see uh, not the information in silos, but all in together. <laughs> okay. Um, I think this is uh, basically coming to an end. Um, I'm not sure what I'm... <laughs> uh, I don't remember what I'm supposed to talk about more, but if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to take them. <laughs> um, I have a question then. <laughs> <laughs> yep. What do you see as the like the main challenge uh, in, in, in like the number one problem that you're solving to the customers that, that they have? Why did they are they using like dashboard or or, yep. or, or choose to to do that kind of like observability? So yeah, uh, let me get back to this slide. So the main two goals that we are solving for the customer are these two. So how fast can you discover issues? Uh, for that, we have an automated alerting solution which means if you connect to Dashboard, for example, I'm not trying to sell Dashboard, but if you connect to Dashboard, basically what we do is we uh, list all the resources under your AWS account that um, are serverless, and then do automated alerting for them. So if you have a timeout in one of your Lambda functions, you have a um, DynamoDB uh, throughput error or an API gateway misconfiguration, we help you automatically bubble that up and you are you become aware of that immediately. Uh, the other part that we are focused on is uh, the mean time to resolution part. So we collect the data to visualize that in a meaningful way to construct automated dashboards that make you aware of uh, everything going on in your architecture and then giving you the ability to, the, to search uh, that data so that you can see in any point in time all the relevant information of what went on so you can understand your system and then uh, make fixes or improvements on it. So this is the value offering that we provide. Uh, there are a couple of open source solutions that uh, are kind of, for example, you could do an Elk stack or an Elastic Log Stash and Kibana for log analytics and then a kind of some metrics, um, metric stores and tracing stores. But to put that all together is actually a huge challenge and to uh, tag the individual uh, parts is also a big challenge. So this is what we take care for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, who are your usual users from customer side? Is it developers team itself, or is it uh, some you know program management team, or? Yeah. Um, so historically, there has been developer operations team, or so operations teams and programmers. Uh, what we've seen is that actually those two categories are beginning to merge. So usually our customers are developers who are building the system, who are also tasked with operating the system in production. So it's uh, almost always the builders themselves. How do you actually tag the, all the different parts in, uh, that, uh, in all the logs that uh, get produced in a serverless environment? Oh, it's easy. It's by time. So as we import metric data and then log data, then um, you have all the time stamps. So it's just kind of for any line of um, logs you open, you can see the metric data point in that time and then the tracing data point. But you look at some sort of a, like a tracing. Uh, so yeah, uh, in AWS actually it's provided by X-Ray. So we use the kind of what the cloud provider gives us, and then we pull that in and then put it from silos to kind of have a um, approach when they are all together. Okay, so you actually don't need to instrument everything yeah. in, in yeah. your codes yep. to so use dashboard. Uh, exactly. So this is kind of the differentiating feature that we have. Uh, we started as a Lambda monitoring company, but we see serverless uh, as like Lambda is 
12% of serverless or 10% of serverless, and actually uh, the complexity is around all the managed services that are like the rest of the 90%. So we see uh, less value in instrumenting the uh, actual code, and but rather we see the value in uh, ingesting logs and metrics and traces and then doing an analytics on top of that. So we don't instrument load. It just works while you sign up, it's two minutes, and then you have all the data. Yeah? Uh, not right now. Actually, when it fails, then it fails, and then you you know you get um, you open an incident or the dashboard opens an incident, and then you see the alert, and then you're able to fix it. So there's if it all fails at the same time, then you just get a bunch of alerts. <laughs> yeah. So basically, um, as everything in serverless, uh, serverless has a pay-per-use uh, pricing model, which means that um, for Lambda functions, how much you use uh, is how much you pay. The same thing for serverless. So we, as we ingest data, we price on that data ingestion. Okay. Yeah. There's a free trial period, and there's a free tier as well. So you're able to ingest uh, up to one gigabyte of month uh, a month for free, and then if it goes over, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, but uh, we have like a couple of thousand developers who are just playing around on their hobby projects as well to make it kind of easier to navigate the information. Uh, the monitoring concept or? Um, so actually, uh, me and my co-founder were in 2016 working at Testio, which is a startup that's exactly like a couple of blocks from here. And uh, we built uh, one of the, like we were really early on with serverless and uh, we're doing it at scale. And um, that problem became really imminent. This is going to be a bottleneck for a lot of people. Yeah, I would say that. <laughs> yeah, I, it was our own problem. That's where we kind of went, went with it. Uh, Tade, I'm very sorry, but uh, we seem <laughs> to be <laughs> lost <laughs> a few of your slides. So um, I hope it wouldn't be a big problem just to, to, to yeah. jump through the, through the, a couple of them. And uh, sure. sorry for that. Yeah. Uh, I think they're still missing, though. I have one slide between those two slides. Sorry, <laughs> it's <laughs> gone. You don't have it? No, I, I cannot see it. Yeah. Okay, no worries. Oh, <laughs> no, I mean, it's fine. I think uh, I actually covered most of it. So, um, yeah, maybe w we can take some more questions because, yeah. No more questions? <laughs> yeah? Uh, how do you think uh, our current solution for serverless monitoring are enough for like serious like uh, production usage like for critical applications? Um, We've, we have customers that are running serverless at like huge scale, um, like you know, tens of millions of users. Um, they are pretty happy with it. Uh, I think the kind of challenge right now is that there aren't a lot of experience around that, so you kind of have to follow a lot of best practices. And um, yeah, so I think it is absolutely possible there are people doing it, uh, but we just kind of need to be more experienced at it. And if it's your first service application, then you know, scaling it to 100 million users, you might make some problems. Yeah. 
Any more questions? No. Um, do you have anything else for, from, from, uh, from no. the slides? No, 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 I'm good. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much then. Uh, let's uh, give applause to uh, Ty. So sorry once again for the technical issues, uh, but uh, hopefully it will be everything will be okay with Dan's presentation. I hope so too. <laughs> so I'm Dan. I'm the CTO of the Express Group. We you have probably used our products. We are a Pambotic company. We run all the Delphi's in Latvi Lithuania and Estonia, and we have much more stuff than that. And I hope I get to my slides as well. Can you press the next button? And then next after that. So to get some numbers into perspective, so we have uh, we are kind of old school. We still have data centers. We have four of them: one in Estonia, a twin in Estonia, one in Latvia, and one in Lithuania. We have uh, around four million user reach, and then any particular moment except for the night we have like 100,000 and if there are breaking news we can uh, double that number in like in the matter of 10 minutes for example if Estonian uh, topping team starts skiing you just go up super super fast I'll have literally seen graphs go like like this and uh, during the course of one month we burn a pump almost uh, more than one petabyte of data most of this traffic is uh, it's pretty dumb. It's images, videos, static files. But still, we've got some, uh, a lot of API traffic as well. We have, uh, we have a lot of uh, legacy stuff. So we have like three, almost like 300 services. Almost all of them are multiplied by three because they deploy it in every country. So we currently live in two worlds. One world is the old school monolith world, we call it the Delphi 1.0, and the second world is a new one that we have been building for a year and a half now in the microservices world. Uh, you as an end user, some of you have kind of been using it at some point. This world covers like content part, comment part, login part, and uh, to go a bit deeper from starting like super high up, our services are divided like in three biggest groups. So we have portals, Delphi's, in Estonia Express, uh, Monolith, uh, Apple, a lot of them. We have the API layer and we have the internal tools layer. Uh, all of this is hosted on premises. And uh, I think like a year ago, we thought, okay, let's, let's try this cloud thing. Let's take one big system that we have that is crucial to our cr critical business process that is involves uh, getting images outside. So we took a digital asset management. We were stupid enough to build it like, from ground up or for ourselves. And we thought, okay, let's not, uh, let's not use our own services. Let's use AWS. And ended up building something like this this is a bit uh, simplified version of how it works li like, but uh, it's, it's completely valid. So we have two types of users using this system, basically. We have, a, for example, a photographer who comes from a shoot. He needs to upload a lot of images, sometimes like working, uh, sometimes a couple of photographers working at the same um, event. Uh, the photographer would use a user interface to upload those images. Uh, the the interface would contact one of the AWS uh, lambdas to get uh, an URL, a signed URL, to directly upload the image to the S3 bucket. After that, we would uh, kick off the entire pipeline of processing that single, that one particular image. We are using uh, Amazon Step Functions to, uh, to orchestrate the entire workflow. It would generate all kinds of thumbnails. We would take all the metadata out a lot of uh, EXIF and things like that. We would send some of the images to the AWS recognition to recognize uh, objects, to recognize faces. 
Uh, we have pretty extensive database of Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian famous people. And then we would store it in the managed service, uh, in a managed Elastic service. Uh, we don't serve these images directly to the end user. We use our own proxies. Um, the images that are with the dashes around them are, some are the services that are hosted within our own infrastructure. So that you as an end user would be first hitting our own local proxies. If those proxies would detect the okay, that this image has not been cached, then it would go to AWS and fetch it. Uh, we would really love to not use our own proxies, but on our scale, it would become super expensive for us. And uh, our traffic compared to maybe any other company is a bit different. Uh, Estonians don't really care about Latvian Delphi. Estonians don't really care about Lithuanian Delphi and the vice versa. So our traffic is very, very regional. So it's Estonian traffic, Estonians using, and plus some maybe expat Estonians from somewhere else, using Estonian Delphi, the same, it's partitioned. So that's, that's why we're trying to be wise about our AWS bill, otherwise it will just skyrocket. So uh, what did we win uh, having this project being orchestrated through Lambda? Uh, through, through AWS. Uh, we basically got rid of three dumb instances which were previously in each particular country. Like we had separate dumb in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. We have onboarded like close to maybe 15 components that were legacy based running on some really custom Linux. Really nasty stuff there. Uh, our developers got their new experience and we got uh, a new stack in one particular domain. But all of this did not come without any challenges. So one of the challenges for our team was that they didn't know the technology before. It took some time for them to get started using it, but still they, they got it using. The cost for us since we were used, like we have a data center, we have a fixed cost, we have the SUS admins, we pay for the bandwidth upfront, the service are running, they all fully paid for. So for us, the cost part was kind of like guesstimation and we are thankful for the Codevisor guys for hooking up uh, with the free credits so that we can have like real med a real cost behind our um, usage without uh, me making uh, guesstimation mistakes. Thank you guys. So the other challenge was to get all this data uh, from our data centers, all those images. Luckily that we don't store the raw images, otherwise it would be like in petabyte scale. We had to move around like 50, 50 terabytes into, into AWS, which took some time as well. Uh, from the process side, we kind of increased our complexity because we have our data centers and we have the AWS, so we are kind of like this hybrid cloud. From the process side, we had uh, to tune up some things because we have a team of sysadmins who were not using cloud before. Um, and it took, some it took some time to optimize those things but uh, hopefully we'll be there soon. And yeah, questions? Uh, I bet you have uh, some nice questions for the like real live example of, of, of doing serverless uh, right from the beginning. So uh, who will be the first one? No one. <laughs> uh, All right. Sorry, just the mic for, uh, for the live stream to hear this. Uh, not about serverless, but which region do you choose? Stockholm. Oh. It's the closest one for us. Latency wise, it's maybe 10, 15 milliseconds. So we actually were really, really waiting for it. Uh, when we started the project, we were putting all our stuff to Frankfurt, the closest one. And then we knew that it's going to come. And now it's Stockholm, like 15 milliseconds from all the countries. And uh, do you have like problems with uh, Absent services in Stockholm region. Like Absent services. Um, uh, we have not. We we have not had that issue. I I know about that issue. There are like some services. But actually, uh, the recognition. The recognition was not in Stockholm. Is not in Stockholm yet. So that that's hopefully soon there. And uh, what are you using for monitoring? Monitoring. Um, so we're using uh, the serverless framework. Uh, we are not using dashboard yet probably should because I could relate to all of those problems that, yeah. that were mentioned Have a here. business opportunity for you. Yes. 
just just on a scale level, like on this API layer, we push like almost half a billion requests a month. So in two months, we'll be like double of that, double of that, because we're like launching all the services in every country and uh, pushing a lot of GraphQL queries. Yeah, thank you. Uh. I know this guy. <laughs> So uh, you did the image uh, or yeah, uh, images and all of this uh, like uh, uh, assets uh, yes. in S3. So what's next or are you doing anything next? On the dump side, uh, we might do video. Video is much harder to do. We were stupid enough to start doing images on the, our own. We should have probably taken like a off the shelf product, but there was some context inside uh, uh, around it. We might flirt with uh, Putting one of the domains, for example, comments, entire Delphi comments in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia are coming from cloud. Uh, because it's so loosely coupled, we might we can use part of the stack. We can just move somewhere else, as long as it's uh, as long as it's a standard Kubernetes cluster. More questions? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I bet you're hungry, but first of all, let's give applause to Dan. Yeah, thank, you. Yes. thank you very much for finding the courage. And uh, to, to yes, to, it to took a lot of courage <laughs> to talk about things, uh, facts, yeah. no persuasion here. Yeah. So uh, now, now it's time for us, uh, time for discussion. So uh, first of all, don't miss the chance to 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 get some snacks and everything to to refresh and. We have Tavi, we have Dan, we have Paul over here, uh, the speakers uh, who are ready to discuss and answer your questions. We also have myself and Martin from Cloudvisor, there's Villa from AWS, and Eric, Eric at the back, AWS as well, uh, actually responsible for startups in our region, so uh, please approach them. We're really eager to, to talk about anything uh, connected to AWS. Thank you.